The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another over who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God who loves us, God who once walked among us, and God who spurs us ever on. Amen. Questions. What do you think about questions? How do you feel about questions? Questions are a great tool for learning. There is something to that saying, the only dumb questions are the ones we don't ask. As a toddler and preschooler, one of my children was especially curious. He loved to ask questions all day long. The answer to one question would lead to another question. I remember reaching a point of saying, more often than I'd like to admit, Mommy's tired now. Let's wait, <laughs> Let's wait until later before we have any more questions, OK? Questions are an important way we learn and grow. So I'm sorry there were times I turned off my son's questions, even just for a time. As we learn and grow, we become more reluctant to ask questions. Let's face it, it takes a certain humility to ask questions. It's an admission there's something we don't know. I still remember well my math class senior year in high school. I often didn't understand the lesson. At first, I asked a lot of questions in class, but after a while, too many of my fellow students groaned and said, oh, don't you know that? Are you asking that question again? And so I quit asking questions. At a high school reunion this fall, I said to one of my classmates, you sat next to me in Mr. Davis's senior math class. Yeah, he said, I hope you fared better in that class than I did. I didn't, but thank you for being the person who made me feel a little better about myself in that class. My experience in that class definitely put a damper on my comfort in asking questions. One of the many things I love about the Episcopal Church is that we not only allow, we invite and encourage questions. In one of my former parishes, a woman who was probably in her 60s dropped by one day. She was definitely seeking something, but she wasn't sure church was it, because she felt she couldn't believe everything church stood for. After we talked for a while, I gave her a copy of the book, Loving the Questions, and it was enough to keep her coming back, continuing to explore, continuing to ask questions. Written by Mary Ann Mix, who taught at Virginia Seminary, the book is a series of reflections on questions raised by the Nicene Creed. 
One of the things Marianne does in the book is to teach us not only to ask the questions, but to delight in them. Faith accompanied by doubt, she believes, is far healthier than faith that never asks why. In today's gospel story, I want to say to the disciples, just ask some questions. To set the context, this is soon after Peter has confessed Jesus to be the Messiah. Jesus has predicted his passion for the first time, and Peter has rebuked him for having thoughts that he must suffer and die and be raised again. That did not fit Peter's definition of the Messiah. Peter and James and John then witnessed Jesus transfigured on the holy mountain. Now, Jesus and all 12 of his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem, where that predicted betrayal and death await Jesus. It's kind of surprising to me that they pass right through Galilee, Jesus' hometown. You'd think his campaign manager might have said, why not stop there, Jesus? People know you there. They'll all come out to hear you teach. It would be a good place to build your numbers, get more support for your ministry. But instead of stopping in Galilee, Jesus keeps on walking right on to Capernaum. On the way, Jesus shares his second passion prediction with the disciples. He tells them exactly what will happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. I understand their fear. Thinking about their rabbi and teacher and friend being killed by human hands was a scary thing. He would rise again? What did that mean? They had recently left behind everything to follow this man they knew to be a great teacher. They were beginning to catch glimpses of Jesus being more than just a great teacher. Certainly the transfiguration was evidence of that. And then there were the healings. Maybe he was the long-awaited Messiah, the one they hoped would save them from their Roman oppressors. That's the kind of Messiah they expected, a warrior, a liberator, not someone who would be betrayed and killed. This talk of his death was really frightening. I wish they had asked some questions, though. The, my, the disciples must have had a ton of them, but they were afraid to ask, and that fear kept them quiet. They didn't ask Jesus what his prediction meant. They didn't ask him to say more about it. When the disciples avoid asking hard questions, they start to focus on posturing about who is right and who is best. They retreat to the world as they know it. Rank and status matter in that world. So they just start, start discussing which of them is the greatest, which one is the best disciple. Peter probably thought he was the greatest. He correctly identified Jesus as the Messiah. James and John likely argued they, along with Peter, were invited to witness the transfiguration, so they're definitely part of the inner circle. It's human nature to want to be the best. The best student in the math class, haha. -ha. The best worker in the office. The best soccer player on the team. Just look back to the Summer Olympics and how hard each of those athletes had worked to be the very best in their sport. Fortunately, Jesus shows us throughout his life that greatness doesn't come from proving we're any better than anyone else. It comes from serving the least among us. Arriving in Capernaum, Jesus gathers his disciples in a house. I wonder if it was Peter's house. And I notice that Jesus pulls his disciples aside, away from the others, before he reprimands them. I also notice that when Jesus withdraws alone with the Twelve, it's usually because he wants to teach them. So, what were you arguing about on the way, he asked them. They look away. They look down at their sandaled feet, embarrassed. They don't have to tell him what they'd been talking about. He knew. Whoever wants to be first, he teaches them, must be last of all and servant of all. And then to demonstrate his point, Jesus picks up a child and puts her in the midst of them. 
Whoever welcomes a child in my name welcomes me, and not only me, but the one who sent me. Children in that time and culture had no status, no rights. They were the lowest on the totem pole. So for Jesus to tell his disciples that to welcome a lowly child is to welcome him, he's turning their ideas about greatness upside down. The last and the least will be the first and the greatest. In our world, we know what it's like when our human obsession with being right gets the better of us and gets the better of our curiosity and keeps us from asking questions. We see what's happening in our partisan politics today. It's all too easy to let our fear demonize those with whom we disagree, instead of asking the next question, which could be, can you tell me more about why you feel that way, why you think that way? I found myself in that place this week. I was at, at a lunch table before Bridge with three others who I quickly learned will be voting for the candidate I will not be voting for. And they kept talking about their candidate. I wish I had been able to ask, can you tell me more about why you feel that way? And would you be interested in hearing my thoughts? But I didn't do that. I felt outnumbered, and so I remained quiet. And I have to confess, I was angry. I don't know what your impressions are, but I think this might be the most contentious election time I can remember. I was talking with one of my daughters about my experience at the lunch table. I know how you feel, she told me. We're having a hard time staying on friendly terms with some of our neighbors just because of politics. Can we, with God's help, push past our fear and be willing to ask the next question? Asking questions does require a certain amount of humility. To ask a question is to admit, I don't have it all figured out. Asking questions reveals there are gaps in our understanding. But asking those questions is how we open ourselves to other human beings, especially to those with whom we disagree. It's how we stay connected, stay in relationship. Can we have those difficult conversations? In her book, Tell Me More, author Kelly Corrigan talks about a work dinner her husband Edward went to. Seated next to him was an older man dressed in a rather ill-fitting suit. He didn't quite fit in. Edward tried engaging him in conversation, but nothing seemed to click. Under the table, Edward texted his wife, this is really boring. And then someone at the table mentioned Cambodia. Kelly's husband turned to the man and asked him if he'd ever been to Cambodia. Yes, the man told him. He'd been there after spending several years in a as a political prisoner in Madagascar. For 32 months, he was in one cell with rats running everywhere. Suddenly, everyone at the table had questions for the man. By asking questions, they discovered the man in the ill-fitting suit was an undefeated boxing and judo champion. He had filed 40 patents and was suing the Dallas Cowboys for using his retractable roof design without his permission. George Clooney had just been on rights to this man's story. Later that evening, Kelly's husband said, makes you wonder what else people might tell you if you just keep asking questions. Makes us wonder what might happen if we just keep asking questions. Who might be sitting next to us? Let's learn to love the questions. Let's commit to staying in relationship. It's one way we live into that promise in our baptismal covenant that we will respect the dignity of every human being. Amen.